gentlemen, it is my great pleasure to welcome you into the second event uh, in the annual lecture series of Simon Frizzi University Center for the Comparative Study of Muslims and Spanish Cultures. Uh, my name is Thomas Kuh and I teach modern Middle East history with a particular emphasis on the Ottoman Empire uh, here at SFU. As an Ottomanist, I'm especially, I'm especially delighted to introduce you to uh, tonight's speaker, Professor Al Mikhail, uh, who is going to lecture on Iceland, Egypt, Istanbul climate. Professor Mikhail uh, received his PhD from the University of California, Berkeley, in 2008, and has been a professor of Middle East history at Yale uh, since 2010. El Mikhail is one of the very few scholars who can truly claim to have changed the way we look at the history of the Ottoman Empire in the early modern period. Um, by writing the history of the 17th uh, and 18th century Ottoman Empire, and especially of Egypt during this period, into environmental history, he has demonstrated to us that the ways in which local people lived with and managed resources such as water, timber and animals, and the way they dealt with and were affected by uh, climate change really matters to the way we understand Ottoman political, social, and economic realities. Professor Mikhail is the author, co-author, and editor uh, of over 40 monographs, articles, book chapters, and edited collections. His Berkeley dissertation, his two monographs, Nature and Empire in, uh, in Ottoman Egypt, uh, Cambridge University Press 2011, and the Animal in Ottoman Egypt, Oxford University Press, uh, 2014, as well as numerous of his, uh, his published articles, have won multiple awards uh, and uh, have been recognized for their excellence. With this in mind, uh, I'm very excited to have Professor Mikhail here and, and open the floor to him. But just before I do that, uh, I would ask you to turn off your cell phones and not to record um, uh, this lecture tonight because we are going to do this for you. So in a couple of weeks you are going to uh, have the pleasure of reviewing uh, this event on the website of the CCSMSC. Uh, Professor Mikhail, I understand, is going to lecture for about 40 minutes and then uh, we have about 20 minutes of Q&A. Uh, join me in welcoming uh, Mikhail. So thank you very much, Thomas, for that very kind and generous introduction. Thank you all for coming. My thanks to the Center for this very generous um, invitation. I'm really excited uh, to get to chat with you about uh, some of the things that I'm working on these days. Um, I, I looked on the website at previous year's speakers, and it's quite an august list of people, so it's quite an honor, a little bit intimidating to be, um, uh, to be counted among them. Um, so the talk that I'm, I'm giving tonight um, is about the effects of a volcano, a volcano in Iceland, on Egypt. And it's a story that I came across a couple times while I was working on um, research related um, to the books that Thomas mentioned, and one that's forthcoming, this third one, um, in which I tried to use the tools of environmental history to help us understand something of the political, economic, um, and social changes that the Ottoman Empire, and specifically Egypt within the Ottoman Empire, experienced in the early modern period, and then in the 19th century. So these are changes that, as many of you know, Middle East historians have been interested in for quite some time. And I tried to bring some new tools and methods to answer some of these older questions. So for example, in this book on human-animal relations, I tried to map how economic and political changes uh, in the empire worked through and were impacted by um, the changing relationship between humans and various sorts of animals. So the main processes that I was interested in in that work um, were commercialization, uh, the involvement of the empire in the world economy, and the formation of capitalist labor regimes around the turn of the 19th century. So in working on this period, the turn of the 19th century, 
I would occasionally bump up against this story of this volcano in Iceland. Um, and so for a while now, I've been trying to drill down a little bit deeper into the story of uh, the <coughs> volcano, and more generally, the story of uh, climate in, uh, in the Ottoman Empire and elsewhere. Um, and so the talk that I'm, I'm, I'm giving is an effort of trying to figure out um, this, this impact of the volcano uh, on um, Ottoman Egypt. Um, this is some of the work that I've done so far with others, of course, um, and following on the very important work of scholars like Sam White, who has written a very good book on the Little Ice Age in the Ottoman Empire. Tonight, I'm going to focus mostly on what the story of the volcano teaches us about doing global environmental history. One of the strengths of the burgeoning um, field of Middle East environmental history, if we can call it a field, um, has been the chance to think about the place of the Middle East in global history. And so Sam's White, Sam White's work on uh, the Ottoman Empire and the Little Ice Age is a very good example um, of this. But most Middle East historians who are interested in global history take a very different tack um, and don't really work on environmental history. Uh, they work on things like global commerce, the circulation of ideas, studies of disease, commodity histories, intellectual histories, histories of trade. And all of this has been very productive and useful in helping us to put the Middle East in dialogue with other historiographies. One version of doing this brand of global history is to trace the connections between peoples in a particular region, in this case the Middle East, um, with people elsewhere in the world. So, uh, while this is a very fashionable thing to do, I think it's very important for all of us who are interested in these questions to always remember that most people in the early modern period probably stuck very close to home. Um, even as we are enamored by stories of global travel or of you know, global connections, uh, it's always important to keep this in mind. We have, of course, superlative examples of people who traveled very far indeed, um, both within the confines of the empire and outside of it. So Evliya Chelebi, for example, um, went uh, to lots of places within the empire. Uh, the yearly pilgrims to the Hejaz, another example of, of long-distance um, travel. Very, very few Ottomans went to Gujarat or Venice or further afield. Even if they didn't go physically, though, they might still experience these other parts of the world through consumption, um, maybe reading or hearing about these other places, and, and far less frequently actually meeting people uh, from those places. So, so in the talk, I want to suggest another way in which people in the Ottoman Empire experience very far away places. This is through the connections uh, forged by environmental and geophysical processes. Volcanoes, wind currents, atmospheric pressure. As we'll see, such an environmental focus will reveal faraway connections that Ottomanists have rarely considered. And I'll try to show um, how these connections were deeply impactful on Ottoman local affairs. So the specific story, again, is this explosion of a volcano uh, in 1783 and 1784. The name of the volcano is Laki, L-A-K-I. It's one of the largest volcanic eruptions in recorded history. It led to two years of cold summers and extreme winters in Europe, North America, the Mediterranean, and Central Asia. A lot of the history of the volcano in North America and Europe is fairly well known, um, but no one has, has yet um, told the Ottoman Egyptian uh, story. This environmental history of an Icelandic volcano, um, I want to argue, helps to explain some of the political, economic, and social history of Egypt at the end of the 18th century. I think this history remains incomplete without a consideration of this volcano in Iceland. Connecting Iceland and Egypt also helps us to overcome conventional conceptions of political geography helps to extend our imagination of what the Ottoman Empire was, and helps to put at center stage two places that have so far been rather marginal to global history, Iceland and Egypt. Okay, so before I jump in with uh, both feet, I wanted to give you uh, 
the only other example I know of, of connections between Iceland and uh, the Middle East. And this is the story of Barbary raids, so from North Africa on Iceland in the summer of 1627. Um, and we have a captivity narrative that relates uh, the course of these raids. According to the narrative, 400 people in Iceland were captured, um, um, and um, taken first to Algiers. And the author of this account uh, relates his, um, his journey first through Algiers, Laverno, Marseille, Copenhagen, eventually back. Um, to Iceland. So it's a very, um, um, I don't want to say wonderful, but very interesting story um, that I'd be happy to talk about a bit later, if you like. Um, it, the account has been translated into English. I don't read Icelandic. Um, uh, it is a great, it, it's, it's great for teaching. I use it all the time. Okay, so for now, um, sit back, relax, um, as I try to convince you that there is indeed a place called Ottoman Iceland. Uh, that Iceland has an Ottoman past, and that the Ottoman Empire's history includes Iceland. Okay, so, on the morning of June 1st, 1783, Iceland started to shake. After a week of earthquakes in the south of the land of fire and ice, a landscape of volcanoes and glaciers, a black haze appeared over the lackey fissure. So I'm going to call it a volcano. Uh, it is a 27 kilometer long fissure that had various eruption points along the 27 kilometers. So this is a, a modern picture, obviously. I'll just um, show you a few pictures of lackey. So the black line up there is roughly where it is in Iceland. Um, tectonic plates, and then a sort of detail of, um, of the explosion site. This is Lackey in Icelandic popular culture, a stamp that was released on the 200 year anniversary, 1983. Another picture of the fissure. And here is a satellite uh, image of the fissure, and then giving you a sense of what it is. Yeah, so. so it began erupting June 1st, 1783. For the next eight months, um, the seam in the island's rock would spew lava, dust, and smoke into the air and rattle Iceland's residents with earthquakes and tremors. When all was said and done, the Blackie eruption produced more <coughs> lava flow uh, than all but one other volcano in recorded history. The largest was another Icelandic volcano um, named Katla in 943. Lackey shot magma uh, as high as 1,400 meters into the air and affected temperatures from Greenland uh, to China. It caused famine and devastation um, in Iceland itself, killing about a fifth of the island's population, 10,000 people, reducing uh, the island's population to about 38,000, or roughly um, its population um, in the first century of its settlement in the ninth century. It also killed off countless numbers of animals, 80% of, of, of the island's sheep, 75% of its horses, and 50% of its cattle. So Iceland was, of course, no stranger to volcanoes. Uh, throughout its history, it's been forged and reforged through the power of the Earth's fire. But the eruptions of 1783 and 84 were more colossal than nearly anything else the island had ever seen. We're lucky to have an eyewitness account of these events in 1783 and 84, written by a priest named John, um, um, uh, sorry, John Steingrimson. Uh, he's known in history as the fire priest because of a supposed miracle in which uh, flowing lava destroyed everything um, around his church except the church itself. So his journal, Steingrimson's journal, offers us a sort of play-by-play -play account of um, Lackey, beginning from its first eruption in June 1783 and until its last eruption in February 1784. And the details of this account can be corroborated and supplemented by the work of historical climatologists. So we learn, for example, that the eruptions were most intense at the beginning of the eighth-month period, uh, 10 occurred in the first five months, 
Uh, Lattice magma volume, as you see here, um, in June was about 8 cubic kilometers, around 1.5 in July, 2 in August, 1 in September, tapering off uh, until the final explosions in February 84. About 93% of the magma had discharged by October. Okay, so sort of by October, kind of 93% done. So it wasn't only Icelanders that had to deal with the consequences of Lackey. From Alaska, um, in the west, to Central Asia, in the east, people all over the world were affected by these explosions in 83 and 84. The primary means through which Lackey impacted the globe was sulfur dioxide. Okay. Um, the volcano released approximately 122 megatons of the gas into the atmosphere. Within a few short days of the first eruption um, in June 83, in some cases within 48 hours, this sulfur dioxide had impacted Greenland, mainland Europe, and the Mediterranean. Uh, so this map and the one I'm going to show you um, afterwards is a compilation from weather logs and contemporary accounts uh -oh, from the summer of 1783 uh, that allow us to reconstruct the chronological course of ash um, and acid rain that came with the Lackey Haze, which is the name given to the visible cloud that uh, was seen um, um, in this blob area um, um, in the summer of 1783. Um, each of those dots uh, it has a date, and I'll show you the dates in the next, in the next slide. So, uh, Benjamin Franklin, for example, was in uh, was the U.S. ambassador to France, and in his log writes that he saw a haze over Paris that summer. So this is a little more detail. Um, each of the the over mainland Europe there, each of those numbers is the date in June uh, uh, that is pegged to a certain eyewitness account of the haze. Okay. All right. So, um, with this cloud, okay, and I want to stress this is the visible cloud. So, if some of you may remember, I don't know what it was, maybe 10 years ago now, there was another volcanic explosion in Iceland that grounded planes um, going um, to and from Europe for something like a week. So, if you think, that's the kind of thing that we're talking about here. So, in this cloud, acid rain and ash uh, 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 began falling over the Faroe Islands, the western coast of Norway, and Scotland by as early as June 10th. In Britain, the sulfuric haze was seen on June 16th. Hungary, June 23rd. Gem Denmark, June uh, 24th. St. Petersburg, the 26th. Moscow um, on the 30th. And then also the only eyewitness reference we have from the Middle East, um, Lebanon, also on June 30th. Uh, the haze. Um, uh, was pointed to through other climatological evidence in China and Alaska that summer as well. So within three short weeks, Lackey had spewed its ash all across the northern hemisphere, so roughly that circle you see there, uh, from about 35 degrees north to, uh, to the North Pole. And as it had done in Iceland, Lackey immediately affected plants, animals, and humans in Europe. So acid rain damaged vegetation in Norway, Denmark, and England. In Holland, at the end of uh, June 1783, many people reported headaches, asthma, respiratory problems resulting from the sulfur in the air. Acid precipitation and sulfuric haze were most pronounced that summer in June and July of 1783, all the way to the northern coast of um, the Mediterranean. <coughs> So again, this was the visible haze. After the visible haze had disappeared, there were much longer and more impactful consequences of the Lackey eruption. And this had to do with the volcano's uh, very unique climate effects. <coughs> Lackey was exceptional for several reasons. So first, the sheer volume of sulfur dioxide it produced. Again, based on the reconstruction of historical climatologists, 122 megatons, which if you didn't know, is a lot. I didn't know, but comparatively, that's a lot. Um, most importantly for its climate impacts, a Lackey, Lackey's eruption columns extended very high into the air 
9 um, to 14 kilometers, much higher than that of most other volcanoes. So this means that an extremely high percentage of Lackey's 122 <coughs> megatons of sulfur dioxide was released um, into the um, upper levels of the atmosphere. It's estimated that about 95 megatons of uh, the volcano's sulfur dioxide made it into the polar jet stream. Because Lackey sent sulfur dioxide to such high elevations, um, and again, consistently over the course of several months, uh, concentrations of the gas uh, were replenished and remained elevated for quite a long time. And once it was in the air, in the polar jet stream, uh, the sulfur dioxide aerosolized with moisture to produce sulfur dioxide aerosol. Okay. So it's the global distribution of this aerosol now in the polar jet stream that had impacts far beyond continental Europe and North America, far beyond the visible uh, lackey haze. And it's this global aerosol distribution that ensured that its effects lingered for much longer um, than just those few months of June and July. So what were these effects of this distribution of uh, sulfur dioxide aerosol? Although these climate um, effects uh, varied slightly by region, the largest statistically significant one was a cooling effect. Okay? So, surface temperatures in Europe and North America in the three years after the Lackey eruptions were on average 1.5 degrees Celsius below average. Indeed, the years 1784, 85, 86 were the coldest of the second half of the 18th century, and these are various um, ways of uh, graphing this temperature reduction. Um, in Iceland itself, 20th century mean temperatures in the west and the north of Iceland averaged about negative one degree Celsius. In the winter of 83 and 84, they stayed below negative 15 degrees Celsius. We have anecdotal information about um, you know, how bad this winter was. Uh, boats could not cross between islands in the Danish Straits because of ice cover. People in Amsterdam apparently drove wagons across frozen canals. Vienna couldn't get firewood because the Danube was solid ice. Severe temperatures in, in Italy, Munich, Prague led to food shortages and great hardship. In North America, um, we have accounts of ice blocks in the Mississippi as far south as New Orleans. And again, we have this account from Lebanon that says in July 1783, quote, the winds uh, were said to have blown as in wintertime. In northwest Alaska, 1783 was the coldest summer of the past 400 years and probably of the past 900 years. And again, this is all information um, gleaned from the work of historical climatologists working today. Temperatures dropped globally in 1783 and 84 primarily for two reasons. Um, the first was uh, that the enormous amount of sulfur dioxide in the atmosphere increased what's known as the Earth's albedo. The albedo is a measure of how much solar energy the Earth allows into its atmosphere. So a higher albedo means more solar energy, more heat, um, is being reflected back into space, therefore um, leading to global cooling. So that was what happened in 83 and 84. The other reason for this cooling um, is that this sulfur dioxide aerosol in the Arctic led to a weaker westerly jet stream of warm air across the Atlantic. So cooler temperatures of a weak westerly jet stream had another uh, impact that, again, we know from historical climatologists, that of lessening the African and Indian Ocean monsoon circulations. Okay. So, the monsoons. That finally, finally, brings us uh, to Egypt. So the Indian Ocean monsoons, of course, fed the Nile. So here's another satellite <coughs> image of the monsoons over South Asia moving um, uh, towards uh, East Africa. I tried to get the Horn of Africa on the satellite there to match up on the map. 
unsuccessful. Okay, so moving over the Ethiopian highlands in early summer, the monsoons uh, swelled the upper reaches of the Nile system, eventually flowing to Egypt in June. The river rose um, in the south at Aswan in June and in Cairo by July, peaking in uh, the capital in late August or early September. Lackey erupted in June 1783, so just in time to interrupt that summer's Indian Ocean monsoons. And again, climatological studies make clear that Lackey led to reduced Nile floods in 1783 and 84. So estimates are that the Nile flow was um, decreased by as much as a fifth in those years. Uh, in addition, 1783 was the lowest flood, and 1784 the third lowest of the entire 18th century. Um, so, you know, um, um, two of the top three lowest floods of the century um, right after the Lackey explosion. Um, it goes without saying that the Nile was obviously the lifeline of Egypt, its ultimate source of food, revenue, and power. So a reduction of nearly a fifth um, of its waters would obviously have devastating consequences for Egypt's social, economic, and political structures. So although likely no rural Egyptians had ever heard of a place called Iceland, Lackey was a big part of the reason they suffered in the middle of the 1780s. To fully understand the powerful effects of Lackey on Ottoman Egypt, we first have to understand what was going on in Egypt at that time. The volcano came at a particularly bad time for the Ottoman Empire, the imperial uh, power ruling in Egypt. Uh, a particularly bad time both politically and ecologically. <coughs> Beginning in the 1760s, and those of you who uh, work on Egypt and the Ottoman Empire, this will be very familiar to you. Beginning in the 1760s, local elites in the Egyptian countryside, as they were doing elsewhere in the empire, began pulling away from the central authority of the Ottoman state. While this growing autonomy, of course, served these men very well personally, it also had deleterious effects on local populations and environments. As these um, emerging rural leaders carved out for themselves zones of influence and bases of rural capital, they began to monopolize rural resources, forcibly seized large swaths of land, and adopted modes of extractive agricultural commercial production, forcibly moving workers to fields, withholding tax revenue from the Ottoman state, sometimes even raising small armies, um, to protect their growing economic and political interests. So theirs, in short, is a fairly common story, a project of local political centralization forged through resource monopolization. Not surprisingly, these locals' attempts to seize control of rural human and environmental capital was a cause of great concern for the Ottoman Empire in Istanbul. Probably more so than ever before, at the end of the 18th century, provincial elites in Egypt, as they were doing elsewhere in the empire, exercised nearly autonomous control over land and tax revenue. The most prominent of these magnates in Egypt um, at the end of the 18th century were provincial governors. Um, the two most prominent are Ali Bey of Kibir, this is Ali Bey, and Mohammed Bey Abu Dahab. In the 1760s and 1770s, these two men seized wide tracts of land and used um, the revenues from these properties to pay soldiers and to patronize political and economic partners, both in Egypt and elsewhere. These provincial elites uh, reached the height of their power in the 1770s when their private armies um, um, carried out several invasions of Ottoman Greater Syria, seizing some territory for a few years before being pushed back to Egypt by um, Ottoman imperial forces. So those of you who are familiar with Muhammad Ali in the, um, in the 19th century, also invading um, uh, Greater Syria, these guys are in many ways his precursors. Right? He is the most successful of these. Um, governors that began this process at the end of the 18th century. Uh, so how do we explain this process? Um, 
It has to do, one, with the Russo-Ottoman Wars in the last half of the 18th century, the expanding corporatization of the Ottoman military, and inflationary pressures on the Ottoman economy. All of this led to a realignment of power in various Ottoman provinces at the end of the 18th century. And this is one of the most exciting areas of research on the Ottoman Empire these days, is this process in the 18th century. Um, in Egypt, these local strongmen took advantage of these opportunities created by these imperial changes to gain more power and control over rural resources at the expense of the empire. So these political developments that were taking place at the end of the 18th century worked in concert with, and in many ways depended on, this period's extraordinary ecological stresses. The 1780s and the 1790s were especially trying decades for rural Egyptians for several reasons. First, there were a number of plague epidemics um, and also epizootics, animal epidemics, um, in the countryside in the last 20 years of the decade. So foremost among them, 1784, 85, 87, 88, 91, 92, 99, um, but there are others as well. These are the most prominent. Working in tandem with these disease outbreaks to weaken populations and cause economic and political chaos in the countryside were years of drought, famine, and poor yields. So in all but two years of the last 20 of the 18th century, flood levels, flood levels in Egypt were below average. And again, the very lowest of the entire century was 83, and the third lowest was 84. Taken together, Famine, disease, drought, low yields, widespread human and animal death created a power vacuum in the, Egyptians, in the Egyptian countryside. And this is what allowed local elites to seize land and resources through force, theft, um, to be able to consolidate their um, political uh, power, again at the expense of central authority, um, uh, the central authority of the Ottoman <coughs> Empire. In many ways, then, lackey, uh, was the straw that broke the camel's back. Its effects on Egypt came at an opportune moment for those seeking to pull away from the empire. The drought, famine, and rural economic chaos it helped to cause allowed these local elites to further their efforts at resource consolidation, a phenomenon that would eventually demand a response from Islam. So I don't want to argue that this is a monocausal story, um, you know, over the past five minutes, I've tried to lay out for you um, how it wasn't a monocausal story, how all of these different factors were at play in the countryside, and how Lackey, um, if you like, intervened in, in that already very trying set of circumstances. Had Lackey not erupted, Egypt's growing autonomy from the empire that began in the 1760s likely would have continued, but I think along clearly very different pathways, with different causes uh, and different effects. Lackey was therefore a major factor in Egypt's late 18th century transition towards semi-independence, driven by uh, the centralizing and commercial interests of local elites that would have, again, its ultimate uh, um, um, uh, flowering in the period of Muhammad Ali. It has to be understood Lackey has to be understood as part of the causal pathway of the changes occurring in Egypt in this period. Um, to tell the story otherwise, I think, would be uh, uh, to do counterfactual history. So the sources from Egypt make clear that the volcano um, had effects that precipitated, or if you like, um, participated in the massive crisis that was occurring in the Egyptian countryside. So, the very famous Egyptian chronicler, El Jabarti, wrote of the Nile's dearth in the fall of 1783, and then the food shortages that follows. He writes, quote, The Nile did not rise sufficiently, and it fell rapidly. The ground remained dry in the south, as well as the north. Grain became scarce, scarce, sorry. Grain became scarce. The price of wheat was on the loose, and the poor suffered greatly from hunger. Almost a year later, Ottoman archival records uh, show how another lack of summer floods exacted a similar toll on Egyptians, leading to, quote, great scarcity and dearth. As Jabarti continues about the fall of 1784, quote, 
The fall was like the preceding one with distress, rising prices, and inadequate rise of denial, and continual internal strife. Two consecutive years of bad floods ravaged the countryside, Egypt's economy, and its rural social structure. Land became so progressively unproductive that the taxes garnered from Egypt in um, 1785 were the lowest total in over 60 years. Again, as Javarti writes, the land turned to waste, peasants abandoned their villages because of a lack of irrigation, and many of the poor starved to death. According to another chronicler from this period, period El Cheshev, um, quote, storehouses on the river stayed empty of grain for a whole year, and the granaries from this and the granaries also remained closed. People's daily bread and subsistence were cut off, and they perished regardless of whether they compromised or, or sorry, compromised or cheated. Traveling uh, in Egypt in these same years, uh, the French philosopher and Orientalist Vaudenay corroborated, quote, that the inundation of 1783 was not sufficient. Great part of the lands, therefore, could not be sown for want of being watered, and another part was in the same predicament for want of feed. In 1784, the Nile again did not rise to the favorable height, and the dearth immediately became excessive, end quote. By the end of 1784, he wrote, many men and animals had perished from hunger. So again, none of these writers um, um, ascribed the cause of all of this hardship to Lackey, um, uh, but that is the connection that I am making through uh, this historical climatological evidence that I laid out before. And as in Iceland, um, also in Egypt, drought and hunger in 1783 and 84 made people more susceptible to plague and other diseases. So Vorne again um, guessed that this year, uh, that the famine in these years, quote, um, carried off at Cairo nearly as many as the plague. The plague became, uh, sorry, the plague began in the winter of 1783 and 84, with Volney again saying not less than 1,500 dead bodies taken out of Cairo each day. So these sorts of large round numbers we always have to be um, skeptical of, but the point is that plague killed a lot of people um, in Egypt in these years. It increased its deadly intensity in the summer and fall of 1784, likely because, again, of the previous year's food shortages um, that had weakened people's immunities. Plague again in 1785. The combined forces of drought, famine, and disease decimated rural populations through both dearth and, uh, sorry, through both death and flight. So uh, we have. Uh, a, a phenomenon of urban population increases in this period, driven partly by these processes, by this mayhem in the countryside driving people to cities. Uh, Vornet um, estimated again with a grain of salt that Egypt lost close to one-sixth of its population between 83 and 85. The political possibilities produced by Lackey's environmental impacts immediately contributed to the economic, political, and social transformation of rural Egypt. The local power brokers uh, that I mentioned before took the combined growing stresses of this drought, famine, depopulation as a chance to tighten and extend their authority um, over territories and communities. Banditry, plundering, and violence thus gripped Egypt in the middle of the 1780s. And Jabarti again says, during this period, lawlessness increased. Local emirs and their henchmen looted cargo from ships on the Nile and from transport caravans on roads. They exacted protection money from local communities, stole grain, animals, and cash, and destroyed crops. This <coughs> violence, theft, and turmoil um, further encouraged um, rural depopulation, again, as people fled these circumstances. And uh, again, the chroniclers from this period um, you know, give us um, accounts of this of this, um, of this depopulation. So, Lackey's ecological stresses contributed to this political and economic story of Egypt in the 1780s and 1790s. Attempting to take control of as much of the countryside's dwindling human, agricultural, and financial resources as possible, uh, these rural elites carved out for themselves increasingly autonomous zones of autonomy away from the Ottoman Empire. 
As a result, in June 1785, a special meeting of the Imperial Council was held in the Ottoman Palace in Istanbul to determine <coughs> what the empire could do to restore a strong presence in Egypt, its most lucrative province. So the Sultan, Abdul Hamid I, um, determined that the only plausible course of effective action to um, restore order in Egypt was a full-scale military um, operation by land and sea to attempt to drive out these rebellious leaders. So to help with this venture, the Sultan commissioned a secret report on the current conditions maintaining in Egypt and began preparations uh, in Istanbul for the invasion. Ottoman forces uh, sent to Egypt in, um, uh, in July of 1786 were led by the Grand Admiral Ghazi Hassan Pasha. Um, this is a picture of him. He is from um, uh, Algeria, considered uh, a naval hero in the Turkish Republic. And this is a statue of him in Izmir, which is an important site for the uh, Turkish Navy. He's often depicted with a lion. Uh, because he's from Algeria, so lots of the lions in the, in the Ottoman Empire come from um, Algeria. And also, uh, to impress upon us his uh, enormous power, he supposedly domesticated this lion through sheer force of will and used it to intimidate you know, his political rights. Okay, so this is the guy, I don't think with the lion, that arrived in Egypt in July 1786 and made very quick work of his enemies, these rebellious leaders. Within two months, most of the province's upstarts had been driven into hiding. Ottoman soldiers continued to pursue them, uh, but were forced to retreat from Egypt in October 1787, so over a year later, to join the empire's more pressing military needs in, uh, against the Russians. Once the Ottoman, Ottoman forces had withdrawn, from Egypt, these defiant rural leaders returned and quickly picked up where they had left off. So the Ottoman offensive of 1786 was first and foremost an attempt to prevent Egypt from falling into the hands of an emerging local elite. Fairly common story. It was also, though, an effort to attempt to fight against the ecological consequences of the Lackey eruption. Lackey contributed to the processes that helped push the Egyptian countryside into the drought famine and rural economic and political mayhem that allowed these power brokers to gain an advantage. In the, in the final analysis, we can say that the Ottomans lost to the volcano. The brief reestablishment of central Ottoman control um, in Egypt in the 1780s could not stem the tide of the local autonomy and strongman politics that were developing in this period, and that again, Lackey helped to further. What emerged in Egypt in the 1780s was a kind of crony politics that would shape Egypt for at least the next 150 years, we could argue for even longer than that. And this is a history that Egyptian and Ottoman historians have long tried to explain, as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, uh, through various uh, uh, factors. Uh, the development of a particular brand of 18th century rural Egyptian capitalism, uh, an older generation ascribed this to uh, Napoleon's invasion of 1798. Other historians ascribe it to the creation of various bureaucratic institutions in Egypt in the early 19th century. Acknowledging the importance of, of all of this, um, which I do, an element we need uh, to understand better, I think, is how the rural flux um, of the countryside in the 1780s and 1790s underpinned various political and economic efforts to, to remake the capital regime and the political landscape in Egypt. Wealth in Egypt was always in the countryside. And Lackey is one part, a central part, of this story. Its climate effects were a motor force for the massive environmental and political distress that gripped Egypt in the last decades of the century. So we will fail to understand Lackey's impacts on Ottoman Egypt if we see Egypt only as a geographically bounded political space in Northeast Africa. At one level, it of course was this and is this, um, but it was also an integral part of a global ecosystem and an empire that stretched across the Mediterranean. In the middle of the 1780s, ecosystem and empire clashed in Egypt. 
the faraway Ottoman capital of Istanbul, fought to prevent a farther away volcano in Iceland from pushing Egypt into the hands of local upstarts who wanted territory and rural capital. Overcoming normative geographic and political boundaries, climate history allows us to bring together into a single interpretive framework seemingly disparate historical actors, peasants, local elites, wind currents, sheep, the Ottoman palace, the Nile, uh, and also distant parts of the globe, Iceland, Egypt, Istanbul, to bring them all together into a single interpretive frame. So this, in the end, is what I want to stress about the story of Lackey's impacts on Ottoman Egypt. That to understand the empire, to understand a place like Egypt within the empire, we have to look far beyond its political spatial outlay on the map. Uh, this is a lesson that has most often been learned through an examination of trade and commerce. So the impacts of New World silver in the empire, coffee in Southeast Asia, the tulip craze, and so on. An environmental focus of the sort I've tried to share here is another way of doing this kind of work. Iceland was as important, I want to argue, for understanding rural Egypt in the 1780s, as was the politics of local notables, the reigns of various provincial governors, and the machinations of, um, of these uh, power brokers in the countryside. Our sense of the empire's geography, history, and politics should be capacious enough to bring Iceland or um, uh, several other faraway places into our story of the Ottoman Empire. And extending this frame also allows us then to participate very usefully, I think, in uh, conversations that are far beyond the scope of Ottoman and Middle Eastern history. Thank you.